Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul, and we're glad to have you here. Tonight's show will be dealing with the Supreme Court case that came down July 2nd uh, called State versus Irby. And this is a significant decision here because it solidifies the judicial power over all things. And <laughs> Not totally that bad, but basically they have left the judiciary to be unaccountable to the statutes and constitution of Minnesota. And they had to go to a whole bunch of convoluting, uh, irrational thought processes, in my opinion, in order to come to their decision. Uh, so that's going to be the main topic of discussion today. This is a live call-in show and we'd be glad to have your comments or questions uh, that you may have related to the subject matters that we are talking about. If you want to call in, there's the number 651-747-3838. If you don't want to call in, and uh, send an email to the group uh, or to the show, speechlessmn at gmail.com. You can also watch our past shows at youtube.com backslash speechlessmn and there's a whole variety of them back there. This uh, show deals with judicial accountability, family law reform, and whatever else I want. Um, but we're glad to have you here today. And boy, oh boy, um, you know, uh, life goes on, life ends. I just want you to know that uh, one of our commissioners, and let's go to the scan converter uh, here, one of the commissioners, Greg Donovan, uh, of, the, of the Ramsey County um, SCC uh, Charter Cable Commission here, passed away here July 3rd. And there's a picture of him. Let's see if I can get the uh, picture up a little higher. Um, he passed away. He was from uh, Birchwood Village. And he was on the Ramsey Washington County Suburban Cable Communication uh, Commission. He's also a city council member of Birchwood. Um, and so we just want to send our condolences uh, to his family. Uh, he fought for uh, public access TV and for show this show and shows like this and just uh, to be able to have access because one thing that was happening with big time cable coming in you'd lose the local flavor of what's happening in the community and because of efforts like Greg uh, we're able to do this show and anybody in the community can do a show like this if they want to take the time and effort to do it and it just costs very very little money ten dollars to take a class here or there um, and it takes some time learning the equipment but you can do it and you have the opportunity to do it and so uh, thank you Greg uh, for all your efforts and uh, we appreciate it and to your family uh, uh, we uh, give you our condolences and uh, pray for uh, peace in your family during this time and good uh, memories of Greg all right <coughs> uh, well, part of the activities around here uh, as part of SCC, which this show is not SCC, but it plays on SCC, is you get to go to parades, and they're in parades, and there was a parade this last night, last Wednesday, the White Bear Avenue Parade, and I, I really like parades. It's fun to be in them, and uh, why not be in it rather than watch it? And so we pass, we go out, and uh, I promoted the show, Speechless, and one of the things that I do you know, because my show's for adults, and it's kind of adult content uh, uh, in, in relation to the subject matter of uh, courts and family law, and, you know, kids don't pay too much attention to that. So my target market is uh, adults. Uh, probably not a good thing to do during a parade, but, you know, when I passed out candy, the candy was for the adults. And so... Um, you know, uh, some of the kids were a little disappointed, but you know, they kind of understood, you know, why shouldn't adults have candy at a parade? So the Tootsie Rolls, I, I just said, hey, I got some candy for adults, you know, any adults around here? Of course, they just 
you know, <laughs> raise their hands. I'm an adult, and I'd, I'd question some of them about that, whether they were adult or not. But uh, one other interesting, and then I appreciate all the, uh, you know, keep up the good work, Tim, and like your show. And uh, uh, so I appreciate those people that watch the show, and uh, uh, thanks for the comments. Uh, one uh, junior high kid said, uh, as I was going by, he said, uh, uh, get a speech uh, therapist. <laughs> of course, you know, that's all he said. Of course, the show is called Speechless, so he said, get a speech therapist, and then, you know, maybe you'll be able to speak. That was pretty funny. Uh, so there's comments like that going around. It, it, was, it was a good time. Uh, one very interesting thing, you know, because we have a van, SCC has a van, and there's kind of a choke point at Larpenter and White Bear Avenue where the street got real narrow for whatever reason. And all of a sudden, the kids there saw where the candy was coming from, the back of the van. And, you know, we would go to the back of the van, get the candy, and then pass it out. Well, I, I, I don't know how many were there, but there was, you know, 50 to 150 kids that all of a sudden just swarmed the van. I mean, it was scary. You know, it was, it was a kind of a flash mob thing for candy. And uh, Amanda, one of the staff here at SEC, <laughs> it's just so funny because she turned around and go and says, uh, uh, stop, get away from the van. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, uh, it was so funny to see. I mean, you see the fear in her eyes, you know, and it was not safe for these kids to be rushing the street. They're not supposed to do it, but it was just weird. All of a sudden, boom, they just descended uh, on the van. So uh, fortunately, they did uh, slowly back away. <laughs> yeah, stop, get away from the van, slowly back away, you know. Oh, it was too funny. You had to see it. Anyway, um, okay, we, I will not be doing my show next week, but Diana Longry will be in, and she is going to focus the show on uh, the chief of police in Maplewood, uh, uh, Chief Schnell, I, I believe is his name, and he's trying to develop a program to get five adults into every child's life. And she's going to give a pretty good, I think, a very good history of where this is coming from, what they're trying to uh, accomplish, and what they you know, wh what is this about? You know, what is the history of this? It is something I am not excited about. For one thing, it is not the business of the police chief, the police officers, to be doing this. It's not the business of the city council. It's the business of the freedom of association of the churches, the parents, to determine who gets, uh, who gets put into the life of the child. So the parents may send their kids to a public school or a private school. The parent then is deciding what parent, what other adult is in that child's life. And they, the parent has the authority to pull that kid, their child, away from an adult or not. And all of a sudden here we got the police. Hear this again. We got the police deciding who's going to be the adults in your child's life. This is as fundamentally unconstitutional as you can get. It's, it's an error. What are they trying to do here? What are they trying to accomplish? Whose lives are they trying to control? This just does not sound good. And I'm telling you, this is shades of Nazi Germany. This is shades of the brown shirts, where you have people coming and telling you, I don't like what you're teaching. I don't like how you discipline over here. I don't like what you're doing here. And they're part of the police department, and these adults are mandatory reporters, not that Hey, if a child's being abused, and we have laws about that abuse that it shouldn't be dealt with, uh, but this is not that situation. These are going to be thought police, you know. And, and the bottom line, the parents will not have the authority to decide what five adults and why five. So that's next week on our show, and I, I want you to turn in and watch that. I think you'll find it very fascinating that this is uh, going to go on. Okay. Uh, 
now we're going to get into our main case here, uh, State of Minnesota versus Irby. And you can go, um, if you put the graphic on the third, not number three, but the third uh, speechless logo thing, I have a list there of the case number uh, that we're talking about. Uh, appellate Court in the Supreme Court, A11-1852. This is a very, very fascinating case. Uh, and I'm just afraid that this, I mean, this decision was wrong, but it sets a precedent for our courts. And I'm really disappointed. Justice Anderson was the uh, lead signer on that, or wrote the major decision. Uh, let's see here, um, where I have this, okay, I got it here. I want, I want to show you something because it, I called the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court because I wanted information. And this is something that happens in, in the Supreme Court. A decision gets made, and you, you can find out what judges made this decision because they'll have their name. So let's go to um, the scan converter here. And, uh, so here on the right-hand side of this order, you see Justice Anderson. That name there, right up there, means he wrote the uh, uh, majority opinion. Okay, then you also see a concurring opinion, uh, Justice Strauss. Now, when, when there's a concurring opinion like that, it means he's with the majority but has some things to parse out uh, that are different than the majority opinion but really don't have an effect here. Uh, and then you see a dissent, Justice Page. And uh, so you see three of the, well, and then took no part, right. And there's a reason Justice Wright took no part is because Justice Wright was the person who wrote, um, she was in the appellate court at that time, not the Supreme Court, but the appellate court. And being in the appellate court, since she wrote the decision there, she had to not be uh, making the decision at the Supreme Court. So that's why she took no part. But yet, you know, she's hanging around there. But my question is, who are the other three justices? There's four of them. Who are the other three that participated in this decision? Uh, because if I go 10 years from now and look at this case, I'm not going to know. I, I'm going to have to go do research, find the date of this decision, find the date when they heard the decision, and try to figure out who were the justices at that point in time? Why don't they put the other justices' names down here? And so I called the uh, clerk, or I called the Supreme Court, got the clerk, and they sent me to the Supreme Court commissioner. Well, I never knew the Supreme Court commissioner even existed, uh, that there was one. Now, this was uh, yesterday that I made this phone call, so I'm going to have to find out and do some more research of what a Supreme Court commissioner does. Is that like Ramsey County Commissioner? What kind of authority do they have? What do they do? Um, what's their role? But it was interesting to get to them. So I said, well, who were the other justices? And they go, well, it was the other justices. No, I said, what, what are their names? And they said, oh, well, you have to look it up. And I says, well, why should I have to look it up? Shouldn't it be on the piece of paper? You know, the legislature does the, when they do a vote, they record the vote. You got a vote here. How come I don't have the other names of the people that voted on this opinion? Um, and once in a while I called it an order. They kept correcting me. It was an opinion, and, and they were right. Uh, so, and I explained the situation. How am I going to know 10 years from now? But here's the, here's the other interesting thing. There's another case out there. Uh, oh, and I'm forgetting it right now. Uh, it took 16 months. Uh, Rue v. Bergstrom. It took 16 months for the Supreme Court to make a decision. In that time, Justice Paul Anderson was sitting on the bench, and by the time they made the decision, Justice Paul Anderson retired, and Justice Wright and Justice Lillyhog, while well, another judge also retired, uh, came on the bench. So 
but 16 months later, did they participate in the decision? Their names aren't showing up, and neither are the new judges showing up on, on that case. So, um, so how do we know which way they voted? And who was the people that voted? And how can you hold them accountable? And this is serious because when I called in, I said, who were they? And then they looked at it, and then they did their research, took a little while, and they got the names. And then I found out that Justice Lillyhog, who may not have been on the bench when this case was heard. I, I don't know. I got to go and do my own research. Uh, was in voting with the majority at that case. Now this gets to the point that Justice Lily Hogg is up for election and he's running against Michelle McDonald. Now in my opinion Michelle McDonald would have dissented with Justice Page. We don't know but from what I've heard and know of Michelle McDonald she probably would have dissented with Page. And so, but we know Judge L Justice Lily Hogg went and vo voted with the majority and so it, it was interesting here because you have uh, Barry Anderson who was appointed by Tim Pawlenty, you have uh, Justice Strauss who was appointed by Tim Pawlenty, the Chief Justice Lori Gilday who was appointed by Pawlenty and you have um, Justice Dietzen who was appointed, appointed by Pawlenty. Uh, were in the affirmative, and then Justice Lillyhog, who was appointed by Dayton, uh, who, uh, those were the majority, those were the five in the majority. Uh, Willema Wright, who was appointed by Dayton, took no part because she was part of the appellate court decision. And then you have Justice Page, who was the only justice that was elected by the people did not get appointed to a seat, but has only and always been elected by the people when he's had to run for office. He wrote the dissent. And by the way, his dissent was concise, it was clear, and it made sense. Not the um, convolution that the, uh, the other justices wrote. And we're going to go through that convolution so you can see it how convoluted it was. But this is the problem with transparency and full disclosure. The justices don't want their names, that they didn't write the order, they don't want their names on that page uh, to, uh, to be seen because they didn't write it. Uh, the other thing, and there may be other reasons, uh, but it should be there anyway. Um, I talked, when I talked to the commissioner, uh, Supreme Court commissioner, she said, well, this is, the history of how the courts do their work. And I just said, change the history. It's not right. <laughs> you know, uh, this, I, how am I going to know? You know, and especially in a case like Bergstrom that took 16 months uh, to hear. So, all right, let's get into this case, State versus Irby. Um, and I provided the link. Uh, and actually you can go and do a Google search, State v. Irby, and the order will come up. You might want to get that and read it along with me because it's, uh, it's a fascinating read and we need to parse out, you know, all the various details because you need to know how our Supreme Court thinks and how they're trying to stop any form of judicial accountability. And there's another Supreme Court case coming up here. Um, which is uh, Miser versus, I think the justice name is Lennon, could be Lemon, I just don't remember, um, where she uh, never took an oath of office or filed an oath of office. And this is dealing with that same statute. Now, here's where I will know, in my opinion, if the court is really really stopping any form of accountability because based on this decision in Irby, it should not affect uh, whether Lennon should have, has vacated her office by the way the statute reads. And, but the Supreme Court say, well, because of Irby, uh, we're just not going to hear the Lennon, uh, Miser versus Lennon case. Um, because Irby settled it. Irby did not settle it. Not even, did not even come close. 
and it is just Judge Lennon. Thank you for putting that up there. Uh, so Judge Lennon for three years had not filed her oath of office nor swore an oath of office, uh, is my understanding. And John Miser, uh, who was in her courtroom, found that out and was going before her and asked her to recuse herself because she wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I mean, because she didn't file an oath of office and she is required to do so. Uh, so let's look at the statute here and see what this case is all about. And we're going to read the whole statute to give you a flavor of, of what's taking place. So go to uh, graphic number 10 here and uh, we'll read that. <clears throat> every office, every office, uh, that's every office, uh, shall become vacant on the happening of the following events before the expiration of the term of such office. The death of the incumbent, of course, <laughs> you know, kind of makes sense. You know, the person's dead. Uh, the office is vacant. Somebody, by further law, needs to be appointed or elected. Uh, the incumbent resigns. Uh, the incumbent's removal. The incumbent is removed for one legal reason or another. Here's the subject of this case, number four, the incumbent ceasing to be an inhabitant of the state or if the office is local of the district, county, or city for which the incumbent was elected or appointed or within which the duties of the office are required to be discharged. Okay, that's, that's, the, uh, um, that's the big issue there. Uh, did they move out of their area? Okay, so let's go to graphic 10 to finish, uh, graphic 11 to finish this uh, statute. Number five, it's a vacancy also. The incumbent's conviction of any infamous crime or of any offense following a violation of the official oath. You're sworn in, you can commit an infamous crime. We'd have to do a show on what an infamous crime is. Um, the incumbent's refusal or neglect to take the oath of office or to give or renew the official bond or to deposit or file such oath or bond within the time prescribed. And that's what the Miser versus Lennon case will be, a refusal or neglect to take the oath. Okay, um, so she neglected, that's a vacancy. And this looks like a self-executing statute uh, here. And so the governor needs to appoint. The governor's been notified that they need to appoint. Okay, let's go back to that graphic there, finish the rest. The decision of a competent tribunal declaring the incumbent's election or appointment void. And number eight, the death of the person elected or appointed to fill a vacancy or for a full term uh, before the person qualifies or before the time when the law the person would enter upon the duties of the office would have begun had the person lived. So um, the person dies after they've been appointed or elected and hadn't taken the office yet. Uh, there can be an, uh, uh, a vacancy is declared. Okay, so uh, we're going to get into number four. We're going to get through this case here. And uh, we're going to look at the Constitution. And one of the interesting things that happens is, and I hear this at the court, and I'm just going, this is wrong. So, you know, Paul Anderson has said, former Justice Paul Anderson has said, well, you start with the statute, and then you interpret the Constitution by the statute. And so you interpret the Constitution then, and then you come back to the statute to see if it's constitutional. Uh, it doesn't make sense. What you do is you start with the Constitution, and then you go back to the statute to see if that's constitutional. And first you interpret the Constitution, then you do the statute. And I, honestly, some of these justices don't get it. Or they use it as a way to, um, you know, just manipulate the Constitution to how they want to do it. So let's get into this case here. Okay. The, the final order here was that Minnesota Statute 351.02, Section 4, that section we read, um, 
where a judge moves out or uh, somebody moves away from the area um, does not apply to a district court judge residing in Minnesota but outside her judicial district because a district court judge does not hold a local office as the term is used in the statute. So the key issue comes to be what does local office mean as to whether this judge should be removed or has vacated the office. So let's go back to uh, number 10 and read section 4 here again. The incumbent ceasing to be inhabitant of the state. Okay, you move out of state, you're out of office according to the statute. Doesn't matter what office you hold. Or if the office is local, there's a qualifier, if the office is local, and then it defines local of the district, county, or city for which the incumbent was elected or appointed or within which the duties of the office are required to be discharged. Okay, there's another I I issue there. With, within which the duties of the office are required to be discharged. Okay, so they're hinging everything here on the word local. What does that mean? Uh, so, what happened is this uh, Jeremiah Irby was, uh, had a trial before Judge, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Karasov. <clears throat> Judge Karasov in Hennepin County, and he actually had two trials because the first trial ended up being a mistrial, and the second trial he was convicted of uh, shooting a couple people. It's irrelevant to the case. This whole case is about whether just Judge uh, Karasov, and this one is uh, particular is Patricia Karasov because her ex-husband is also a judge in Hennepin County. And that's a whole nother story of what's going on there. But Karasov moved out of the district to be, during the divorce and everything. She, I mean, she moved to her lake cabin. She vacated her office. She was not living at home. The home was not her residence. She moved to the lake cabin. She tried to hide it. Um, she was not cooperating with the investigation. She ended up getting disciplined. But anyway, that's the issue. Anybody, if you had a traffic ticket and you were before Judge Karasoff, you could have said, you could have filed the same court uh, opinion. But why would you spend thousands of dollars uh, to do that, tens of thousands maybe, when you just pay your $200 fine and go away? You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the decision making process that takes place. But this uh, Jeremiah Irby was represented by uh, the Public Defender's Office, and this was Catherine Middlebrook was um, uh, defended. Let's see, that's the chief appellate public defender, but Theodora uh, Gaitas, I may be pronouncing that wrong, G-A-I-T-A-S, was the assistant state public defender. That's probably the person who... Uh, uh, argued before the Supreme Court. I'm not positive, but either way, uh, these public defenders did a fantastic job. So here, uh, Irby, who couldn't afford it, had a public defender, and the public defender saw this as a serious issue and took it to the Supreme uh, Minnesota, all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and and good for them. And they probably taken some heat for doing that. Um, and especially after this dis decision because the justice really had to do some twisting of things. So um, it just doesn't matter what Irby had done uh, because it's irrelevant. The whole issue is about Karasov. Should she even have been there? Okay, so um, let's go. Uh, so what happened, though, because Karasov had moved out, there was a disciplinary action started by the Minnesota Board on Judicial Standards. And in that decision, Karasov appealed it all the way to the 
Minnesota Supreme Court, and they concluded that the Minnesota Board of Judicial Standards had proven by clear and convincing evidence that Judge Karasoff had failed to reside within her judicial district from July 1, 2009 to September 30, 2009 in violation of Article 6, Section 4 of the Minnesota Constitution. So let's go to um, graph, graphic number 8. We're going to read this section because it's going to be important to understand the statute. Because you start with the Constitution, go to the statute. Judicial districts, judicial judges. The number and boundaries of the judicial district shall be established in the manner provided by law, but the office of a district judge shall not be abolished during his term. There shall be two or more district judges in each district. Each judge of the district court in any district shall be a resident of that district at the time of his selection and during his selection and during uh, his continuance in office. Um, there's probably a few typos <laughs> in there, uh, repeated stuff. So what it says is by the Minnesota Constitution, you got to be a resident of that distri district at the time of selection and during continuance in office. Okay, and Judge Karasoff wasn't. So what happens then? You know, when now that she's no longer there. And so for this violation and her failure to cooperate with the board's investigation, we censured Judge Karasoff and suspended her for six months without pay. So it, it's interesting you know, that they would say, okay, this is a violation. You weren't to move out of your district, but we're going to censure you and suspend you for six months. And um, that was according to our statutes because the legislature established the Board on Judicial Standards to discipline the judges or, or to provide an avenue. There's a three-step process. The Board of Judicial Standards disciplines first or they make a ruling the judge can accept or deny the discipline that the board hands out if they don't like it they can appeal it to a three judge panel and that three judge panel isn't necessarily made up of three judges um, but there's one judge on at least on that panel and if you don't like the decision of that three panel judge then you can go to the Minnesota Supreme Court which happened in this case okay so what happened here is that Irby uh, argued for the purposes here that Judge Karasoff's failure to reside in her district rendered her office vacant under Minnesota Statute 351.02, Section Subdivision 4, providing that every office shall become vacant on the incumbent ceasing to be inhabitant of the state or if the office is local, of the district, county, or city for which incumbent was elected or appointed, or within which the duties of the office are required to be discharged. Under Kirby's theory, Karasoff automatically ceased to be a judge when she moved out of her district uh, in 2009, and thus, despite moving back to the district before Irby's trial, she had no authority to hear cases absent the governor appointing her to her former position. I think he's right. Now, that brings up a whole other issue is if you vacated your office, can the governor appoint you back to your same office? That's a whole other issue that hasn't been dealt with and uh, needs to be dealt with because if you vacate it, you shouldn't be allowed to go back um, to that seat or ever uh, um, based on what vacancy means. Okay. Well, the Court of Appeals rejected Kirby's argument, Irby's argument, and they relied on the Karasov discipline case for their decision, which I think is bizarre. <coughs> and they say, uh, the Court of Appeals reasoned that our suspension rather than removal of the subject judge strongly implied at the very least that the Supreme Court viewed the subject judge as a de facto judge, if not a deserved judge, notwithstanding her residency violation. So here they made their decision on a strongly implied view of the Supreme Court. The appellate court did. 
strongly implied. Uh, I, I just think that's not the basis for making a court decision, something that's strongly applied. Why don't you go with the Constitution and why don't you go with the statute rather than what the Supreme Court did? Yeah, they disciplined Karasov, but that doesn't mean something else can happen. Uh, we'll get into that issue. So anyway, they uh, uh, granted the review in the Supreme Court. So the judicial officer's authority to conduct a trial is a legal question that we view de novo, which means we start back from the beginning. Okay, we, we, we review this from the beginning. Whatever else has happened in the past to get here, we're starting, we're getting a new look at this and uh, we'll go through the laws and uh, we'll go through the jurisdiction. Who has jurisdiction? This is a fresh look. Okay, although we generally, and this is another issue that came up, we generally limit our review of errors to which the defendant did not object at trial to those constituting plain error affecting substantial rights. And Irby did not object to Judge Karasoff presiding at trial. And we have said in cases involving a fundamental question of judicial authority, plain error analysis inappropriate. Okay, and, and this is interesting. So there's plain error analysis. Uh, and I have that, uh, if I can get to that, what that means. Uh, let's see here. Okay, it's the principle that an appellate court, appeals court, can reverse a judgment and order a new trial because of a serious mistake in the proceeding uh, proceedings even though no objection was made at the time the mistake occurred. The issuance of a consistent of inconsistent instructions to a jury that would result in a miscarriage of justice for example can furnish the basis of a new trial even though no timely or proper objection to the instruction was made. Although a person Entitled to a fair trial, he or she is not entitled to a flawless one. The individual does not have the right to a new trial merely because of a harmless error has been committed. All right. Um, so th there's a couple standards there, and the court said, you know, we, we don't need to do that in this case because we just can review this whole thing new, and we don't have to use and apply the plain error analysis here. So th that was interesting <laughs> uh, decision they make. Okay, um, so in Section 351, Minnesota Statutes .024, we conclude that she had failed to reside in her district during the summer. She had failed, and, and in the discipline case, she did fail to reside in the district during that period. And because she retired, continued to reside in Minnesota during the time in question, she did not cease to be an inhabitant of the state, which is the first requirement in subdivision four of statute 351.02 is the incumbent ceasing to be inhabitant of the state. So this would be like a statewide office holder, a governor, a secretary of state, a Supreme Court justice, an appellate court justice, a statewide office, if you cease to live in the state, the office is vacated. Karasov still lived in the state. So this first part here is not under question. They rightly decided that one. Uh, give them credit for that. Um, they better get that one right. Um, so the real issue then comes to the second half of the paragraph that Judge Karasov was no longer an inhabitant of the district. Okay, for which she was elected or appointed or with whom which the duties of her office are required to be discharged. But this language, according to the Supreme Court, is preceded by the words, if the office is local, and you can see it there, uh, under number four there, or if the office is local. Okay, and so here the whole case, what does local mean? Uh, so they go back and say, well, this is a question of first impression by the court. How do we read this? How do we make sense? What's the plain language of this? Um, 
And again, they go back to the beginning and, and review everything without considering, you know, they start from the beginning, hearing everything all over again. They don't eliminate anything. Uh, so first thing, you know, this is what's really interesting. This is like uh, principles of biblical interpretation. You know, what laws do you apply in how to interpret the Bible? Well, it's the same thing with the statutes here. Uh, you begin with the text of the statute. Uh, we're going to ascertain the and effectuate the intention of the legislature. What did the legislature mean by the statute? What were they trying to get at? Okay, and when interpreting a statute, we give words and phrases their plain and ordinary meaning. Okay, and another, this is also called biblical hermeneutics. Well, this is uh, judicial uh, or statutory hermeneutics. Um, so, if the statute is not ambiguous, we apply its plain meaning. Okay, a statute is ambiguous if its language is subject to more than one reasonable interpretation. So, here's where they're going to have to go. And they're setting this up. We're going to have to go to that there's more than one reasonable interpretation of the statute. And we get to decide what's the reasonable interpretation. Okay, um... And here they say it's ambiguous because it is subject to more than one reasonable interpretation. <clears throat> I want to point out here, if we go back to the statute there, uh, get that graphic up here, is an inhabitant of the state or if the office is local, comma, and then it defines what local means, of the district, county, or city for which the incumbent was elected or appointed. Okay, and in the courts, we have district courts where the judges are elected by uh, the people for that judicial district. Now, in our statutes, there are cases when those judges can be dished out to other judicial districts or moved up to the appellate court or moved up to the Supreme Court for specific cases, but the law is clear on that as to who can be, uh, you know, who makes those decisions and when, okay? But the justices themselves, in the plain duty of their job, it's for that judicial district. And many of these justices have a specific county that they deal with. And then you get with Hennepin County, you may have a, city, a specific location that you deal with. And you're in that county and that's where you're staying. So... Uh, but you're elected by the people in that district, and I think that's a big, big issue here. Um, and, and here, there's a footnote, you know, where they say, we begin with the text of the statute. There's a footnote there, Un and it says, unlike the dissent, we conclude that Article 6, Section 4 of the Minnesota Constitution is not the appropriate vehicle for analyzing Irby's claim. Although Article 4, Section 4 states that the district court judge shall be a resident of the district in which the judgeship is held during continuance in office, it does not provide any governance as to the consequences for failing to maintain residency. And they're right, it doesn't. But is there another piece of the Constitution that does make the distinction? Is there another statute that makes the decision? And does that Constitution allow the the uh, statute to um, uh, take effect and, and do its job. Okay, so we got a phone call here, so we're going to take the call here. Caller, do you have a comment or question? Well, I, I have some comments. Uh, okay. This is Diana Longry, and I'm Hi. an attorney. Oh, you're going to be I, on the show next and week. I, <laughs> and <laughs> I understand that at least part of this ruling to to stand for the proposition that because somehow or other that as a district court judge of Hennepin County that her uh, rulings have ramifications statewide, that for whatever reason, that then that means that she doesn't necessarily have to live in the district or that it's not something to be overturned, this ruling that she made because That's she right. wasn't living in the district. That's right. And, and my response to that is that, again, 
sure. There is that question about how do you interpret the word local in the statute. Right. But I would say that a county district is local. And the reason I would point to that is because if you look at Ramsey County or you look at Hennepin County, you know, they have local rules that apply only to their county. Yes. And those rules are specifically called local rules. Right. And that is exactly what they are called. All attorneys know it. All judges know it. And if you don't know your local rules for the particular county, well, you know what? You'll be called out on that and say, well, now, Miss Longry, don't you know the local rules? Uh, you know, not that I've ever been called out like that, but <laughs> it would happen if I didn't know those local rules. And right. so I think that Justice Page has it right and that the idea somehow or other that a county judge in a district doesn't need to live in their district, I, I don't go for that philosophy. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and that was a point I was going to bring up later on, but I gl I'm glad you brought it now because there's a lot of information here, and uh, uh, that's good we got to that because it, I, I, I agree with you uh, absolutely, 100%. Um, there is a distinction here. And so I, I just don't know how they could rationalize what they're doing. Well, thank you. Thank you for the phone yeah. call. Appreciate it. Um, so, I mean, where we were, there was no consequences according to the Constitution, uh, that part of the Constitution. Uh, so I'm going to go and jump ahead here to, let's go to uh, Minnesota, uh, number 13. Okay, uh, here the Minnesota Constitution says retirement, removal, and discipline. That, that should have been in bold, uh, the subject matter. The legislature may provide by law for retirement of all judges and for the extension of the term of any judge who becomes eligible for retirement within three years after expiration of the term for which he is selected. The legislature may also provide for the retirement, removal, or other discipline of any judge who is disabled, incompetent, or guilty of conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. So although Article 6, Section 4 does not provide any form of discipline for uh, somebody who mo a judge who moved out of the district, Article Section 9, uh, you just switch graphic there. Uh, sorry, we can come back to the show here. Article 9 says that the legislature can provide for discipline removal. Okay, so that's where it is, and they need to focus on both parts of that. They, they're combined together. This is under the section of the judiciary, and it's the legislature that gets to do it. But as you find in this decision, the court goes on and says uh, the legisl legislature can't do that. What we have, and let's go to graphic number uh, 14, is we have the legislature, the, the, the court is talking about separation of powers. And here's uh, Article 3. Distribution of the powers of government, division of powers. The powers of government shall be divided into three distinct departments, legislative, executive, and judicial. No person or persons belonging to or, or, uh, or that's, uh, constitute one of these departments shall exercise any of the powers properly belonging to either of the other except in the instance expressly provided in this Constitution. Okay, so... Each branch has separate powers, except, all oh, that word's there. But the court here, in, nowhere in this decision does it acknowledge these separate, it says we got separate powers, but we're not going to acknowledge the exceptions. And there it was. There's the exception, Article uh, 6, Section 9 of the Minnesota Constitution, the legislature provides for the removal, discipline of, of the judiciary. And they don't want to acknowledge it. They talk about it. It's mentioned here, but it's not 
it's not dealt with. It's an exception. It's called checks and balances. The Minnesota Supreme Court did not talk one bit uh, about checks and balances. Okay, and, and you hear this all the time, you know, at the federal level because that's national, that's where the big money goes. But in the state, you don't hear about the checks and balances uh, issue of the Minnesota Constitution. So the legislature does have the authority, but the Minnesota Supreme Court saying it doesn't. Okay. Um, okay, so the rest of the case here, they're just making a big effort to say um, that this is, a this is not a local office, this is a statewide. We got statutes here that interpret this uh, seat as statewide, and I just think they take their... Um, liberties uh, and, and twist things. Here, here's one area. The words office and officer are terms of vague and variable import, the meaning of which necessarily varies with the connection in which they are used. Yes, that's true. Uh, but interpreting the phrase within the context uh, of the statute, uh, we, must, um, we must see a certain case and that, that, prov that provides clarification. So it's important that local is defined in that statute as being district. And this is a judicial district. In other cases, local is defined as something else. And local is defined differently by, for the board on uh, campaign finance board. Local has a different definition. But they quote this as redefining what, uh, as, as a definition of local that should provide uh, be provided for um, the judiciary and they can't do that this is for the campaign finance board and the campaign finance board doesn't do with uh, deal with city races so it, it's just and so they just misinterpret and misapplied what they just said <laughs> it's just amazing to me um, okay um, it actually the Fascinating reading is in, in the footnote, footnotes of this case. Um, so they come to the conclusion then the courts, uh, that uh, reasonable conclude that the district courts are the courts of the state itself and not individual local offices. So while Minnesota once had many courts of limited jurisdiction that might more logically have fallen within the definition of local offices under many statutes, the statute we're talking about, the probate municipal and county courts of the state have now been consolidated into district courts of general jurisdiction. Um, so that, that's, their, that's their answer. It's now all general. It's not local. Uh, and of course, Diana Longrie there uh, rebutted, rebutted that uh, very well. Um, so, and then they go with that uh, some district court judges can sit on the Court of Appeals, which is statewide, you know, but that's provided by the statutes. Okay. Um, oh, we're running out of time here. I would encourage you, as you can see there, go. Google State versus Irby and read this. But um, uh, the one thing I want you to know is Justice Page um, just wrote a, wrote a brilliant, it's not a brilliant dissent, it's just so practical. Uh, one of the core constitutional requirements for, for serving as a district court judge in Minnesota is that the judge must reside in her district during her continuance in office. Okay. And the Minnesota Constitution states in no uncertain terms, each judge of the district court in any district shall be a resident of that district at the time of her selection and during continuance in office. And regarding Kasaroff, we determined that Judge Kasaroff did not reside in her judicial district. Okay, when Judge Kasaroff abandoned her residence, she no longer met one of the two essential qualifications for holding office. You got to live there. I mean, see, here's the plain language issue coming through. And, and Judge Page does it very well. Here's the plain language. Spell it out. You don't have to go through all this convolution. It is because she no longer met the constitutional requirement for holding office, and it's a constitutional uh, requirement of the district court judge in the 4th Judicial District, and not for reasons of judicial discipline, 
that Judge Karasoff forfeited her judicial office. So the other side was saying, hey, only the judiciary has the right to discipline judges. And, of course, they made that up. We've read the Constitution here. It says the legislature has the means of providing for discipline and removal, not two, the two same things. And Justice Page says they put it in statutes. The judge violates the statute. The statute is self-executing. The judge is out of office. The governor needs to appoint. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's self-executing. And that's what this is, and it's the legislature that put it into effect through their statutes which the, we read in our Minnesota Constitution that we gave them the authority to do. And here the Minnesota Supreme Court just took it away. They wrote a law. And here they're, they're, they're declaring, well, it's not our job to write laws. I mean, they, they make that argument here. We can't do this. we we got to go by the plain language of the, the, the legislature and the Constitution and what the original authors meant. And then they go and just rip it to shreds and write their own law. Okay, uh, Justice Page, thank you, thank you, thank you again for making the right decision. You do it all the time in the family law cases to build families and to support families. And you've done it here uh, in this judicial decision, which also is about supporting families. I appreciate your decision, people. It's worth the read. Sorry this took too long, um, but go read it. All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Days go